Hello, everyone. Good morning. I am Brian. I am um, from Forest Foundation Philippines. And thank you for being here with us um, today, September, we celebrate Save Shera Madre Day um, under Proclamation Number 213. And also, this is uh, the day in which we commemorate um, the time when Typhoon Ondoy brought heavy rains and massive flooding that ravaged many areas in Metro Manila and Central Luzon. Um, this catastrophic event um, is actually uh, attributed to continuous degradation and deforestation due to illegal logging, road construction, land conversion, and mining in Sierra Madre, um, which has increased the vulnerability of people and ecosystem. So we gathered here today um, to talk about, to discuss, to tell the story of the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park, uh, one of the Philippines' last great forests. So here's what we're going to expect um, for today's webinar. Um, first, we're going to have a presentation about um, the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park, the past, present, and future to be presented by uh, Sir Jose Maria Lorenzo or Loritan. Um, the legal framework behind the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park um, to be presented uh, by Ms. Cheris June Holongbayan. Um, the ecosystem services, biodiversity, and conservation actions um, from Mabuaya Foundation. Then we're going to have an open forum after the three presentations. We're also going to have a soft launch of the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park, a knowledge platform um, to be facilitated uh, by Ms. Hannah Claire Madamba. Um, and would also like to share with you some grants and partnership opportunities um, from Sir Eric Butuan of Forest Foundation Philippines and a final message to be given by the Executive Director of Forest Foundation Philippines. So let's get straight to it. So to present um, Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park, the past, present, and future um, here with us today is um, Jose Maria Lorenzo or Lori Tan. He's a staunch uh, advocate and activist for biodiversity conservation in the country. He is also a former chairperson of the Forest Foundation Philippines, a member of the Board of Philippine Disaster Resilience Foundation, and member of National Advisory Council of World Wildlife Fund Philippines. He is also an author who published several books, including The Last Great Forest, Luzon Sierra Madre Natural Park, the Field Guide on Whales and Dolphins in the Philippines, and, man and Managing Mindanao's Natural Capital, the Environment in Mindanao's Past, Present, and Future, published by Brain Trust. Good day to you, Sir Laurie. Good morning, guys. Before we start on the park, I would like to focus on the 2019 IPCC Special Report on Global Warming. Without increased and urgent mitigation ambition in the coming years, leading to a sharp decline in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, global warming will surpass 1.5 Celsius in the following decades, leading to an irreversible loss of species in the most fragile ecosystems and crisis after crisis for the most vulnerable people and societies. How will the Philippines be affected by climate change? Today, there are 117 million Filipinos. For the planet, the climate source is driven by carbon use. It continues for oil, gas, coal, cars and trucks, ships and planes, factories power plants. Congestion is an issue. Traffic, population. In the last week, we saw the major cities of NCR blanketed in smog. In urban areas, contagion is a definite concern. Even 10 years, it was clear that vector disease is going to be a social headache. Then we had COVID. 
We thought this was going away, but in the next two weeks, it is climbing back up for the cities of NCR, Central Luzon, Calabar Zone, Western Visayas, Central Visayas, and the Davao region. Now this is an archipelago. Celsius will change sea temperatures in the ocean. Sea level rise is the issue. You know, out of 57 cities and 832 municipalities are situated along the coast. The Philippines has already confirmed about three times that of the global average. This country is expected to experience changes in strong cyclones, storm surge, floods, and heavy rains, especially in coastal cities and towns. For food and agriculture, El Nino periods will affect the country from drought, dry spells, and water supplies. Many city areas and roads rapidly sinking due to groundwater extraction. Cities and towns will affect consumption. Now, how will it affect Cagayan Valley? The major impact is agriculture. This is the top producer of corn in the whole country and the second in rice production. For climate change, the major issue is heat in the valley. It will need water for the river and the streams into the fields. There will be drought or dry spills. For the valley, we will expect damage to crops and induce heat stress to livestock. We are worried of the emergence of pest and an, an animal disease. We will certainly affect people and their heart health. For the valley, the major concern and the major opportunities are clearly linked to corn, rice, agriculture, and food. The other issue is typhoons. IPCC already expects strong weather. The eastern towns, Mahonacan, Palanan, Divilacan, San Mariano, and Dinapigue will be heavily affected by sea levels, storm surges, and flooding. Typhoon Megi, known in the Philippines as Super Typhoon Juan, is considered as one of the most intense ever recorded. On 18 October 2010, Super Typhoon Juan hit landfall in the coastal towns of Isabela. The waves in Mahunahon were as big as houses and swamped the town plaza facing the Pacific Ocean. Toppled trees tripped down power lines, triggered landslides, and whipped up storm surges. In the three coastal towns of Divilacan, Makunacon, and Palanan, as much as 90% of structures were reportedly in ruins. Luzon have provided with natural storm walls that many of the cities and towns of the Cagayan Valley are protected by typhoons in the western side of the great mountain ranges, rivers, and the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park. Despite of that, they want to continue the construction of the Isabella Road from Ilagan to Palanan. This will certainly affect the roads, the flooding, soil erosion, and the landslides of the forest, the park, and the coastal zones. The forests are especially vulnerable to such lineal infrastructure because they include critical ecological species such as Isabella Oriole, Philippine Eagle, Philippine Crocodile, and the Northern Sierra Madre Forest Monitor. Now, if this is managed, there is no question that the road, the forest, and the rice granaries will open the toll gates to expand shifts of temperature 
that will affect dry and wet. For climate change, it is clear that the roads of Isabella are the seeds of tropical forest destruction. On the Pacific coast, this will impact mining projects and tourism. In wet tropical environments, the cut and fill operations associated with road construction can impede river and streams, increase forest flooding, and drastically increase landslides and soil erosion. Perhaps the most damaging aspect of paved highway is that they spawn the networks of secondary roads. And as those roads spread in the northern Sierra Madre Natural Park, the environmental toll grows. The government supports roads. They believe that they provide cost-effective means to promote economic development, access natural resources, and of course, voters. Local communities in remote areas often demand new roads to improve access to land, transportation markets, and medical services. Unfortunately, this is an endless process. No one seems to realize that the first expansion of roads open up forest and the results of colonization the exploitation simply cuts down more and more forest. In Cagayan, let us look at climate change. We will see it in the next seven years. We know that inside the valley, heat will affect agriculture, rivers, food, income, and people. We also know that typhoons will affect the Pacific coast for the big road project, mining company and tourism. If you are required to choose the big management opportunities for climate change, should it be for corn and rice for food and income or to focus on unfinished concrete slabs within a remote frontier? What is important? Should it be for the valley or the coast? Does the national or the provincial government have the institutional capacity, human capital, or financial resources to adequately manage an unfinished road aimed at the Pacific where sea level rise was already three times faster than the global average? as we realize critical events of climate change in the next seven years? Should it be more important to protect the forest, the watersheds, and supply the rice granaries of Cagayan Valley? You know, in 2017, during El Nino, there have already been reports of sea levels where salt water has entered into the Cagayan River. That year, salt have reached the fields of Kataran. It will happen again. With climate change, it will be difficult for Cagayan farmers, traders and suppliers to anticipate the frequency and length of rainy and dry seasons that govern production activities and high variable income. There is no choice. Farmers will find their own solutions. And at the same time, the forest of the NSMNP also needs to manage, anticipate, and react climate shifts that as wilderness, flora and fauna must maintain biodiversity and align its natural rhythms and delivering this last great forest at its critical Philippine role and its unique planetary function. This park can make a difference too. Within this decade, 
the Cagayan Valley must take the appropriate solutions for this generation. Don't wait. By that time, there will be already 125 million Filipinos and temperatures will have changed by 2030. It will probably get worse. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Lordy, for, for grounding the uh, complexity of the natural park by linking climate crisis to food, to water and infrastructure, and also for your call to action, for your provocation to not wait um, to, to realize the importance of forest protection and conservation. Um, if you have questions um, for Sir Lori, uh, you, may, you may chat, uh, you may send them through chat or through the Q&A button. Um, for those who are watching on Facebook, um, you can um, comment your questions and later during the open forum, we'll um, entertain your questions. Thanks again, Sir Lori. For our next presentation, we'll be um, discussing um, the legal framework behind the, the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park. And we have here Ms. Uh, Cheris June Holongbayan, a uh, Senior Ecosystems Management Specialist and also Assistant uh, Protected Area Superintendent of the NSMNP. Good day to you, Ms. Cheris, and uh, welcome to the webinar. Hi, good morning, everyone. Let me just share my screen. All right. So on the history of the park, whenever we think about it as current heirs of the park, it actually makes me feel like we're standing on the shoulder of the giants. If you would just look at how the park started, all the birthing pains, it's really one of our last great forests that we need to protect. Basically, based on our records, it all started in 1979. By then, a letter of instruction from our president, Ferdinand Marcus, that from the Palanan Point, there's a 45-kilometer radius that would protect a forest. So at this year, in 1979, they've already seen the importance of the wilderness area located in the east in Palanan. But as I was saying early on, that the birthing pains, I think, happened between the early 1990s towards the early 2000s. This is where also a significant milestones for our country, the, the, the establishment of the NIPAS, the National Integrated Protected Area System in 1992, gave us a special lens or actually a focused lens towards all of our biological resources that we need to conserve. And through in 1994, the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park was actually part of, identified as part of the top 10 prote protected areas for priority. That's why I guess in this year, this range of 1992 to 2000 these are all these are when all the birthing pains happen with the help of consortium of ngos and the government a lot of awakening happened during this time the communities from a business as usual now they're living in a natural park what changes happened and how would their lives change when you are living within a national park already not everything is allowed because the objective of the park was to conserve this one big area full of biological resources important can only be seen in our country and sometimes only in Luzon so from the wilderness area in 1979 we see the development as it moved into a presidential proclamation, it from the wilderness area, from a one municipality, it transitioned into a bigger scale. It covered now nine municipalities in 1997 through the presidential proclamation number 978 of then Fide President Fidel Ramos. Would you imagine that from an area in Palanan, it expanded? 
expanded widely because we saw based on the studies, based on the efforts of the NGOs who came in and studied the park, that we need, that there is a larger scale that needs to be protected. All of the endemicity we're talking about, the cultural links, these were all under one scope of the NSMNP. So from 1997, we now realize the importance of the park and we see its significance, a national significance at that point. Here you can see, as I've searched some archives, some of our archives, I think in 2000, as I said, burning pains, these are also the times when we started to establish our monitoring systems. And luckily, Northern Shera was also one of the sites among our sites within our country to establish monitoring system on biodiversity, species, and ecosystem. As you can see, these are, I have a lot of photos actually, but I wasn't able to capture it. And I'm always excited to see the history of the park. It's so nostalgic to see 1990s photos. I'm actually geary to see earlier photos that we can share what we've been through and how are we going to go about it, how to preserve this beautiful park. Also, so from that, 1997, we see the significance already. We realize how important, how unique our area is in Isabella. With the help of supportive NGOs, academia, and other stakeholders, from the proclamation, it was signed into its own law by virtue of the 9125 in 2001. So as its own law, the NSMNP Act, we have more strength in the protection and conservation efforts. We have a stronger non-negotiable, as we say. So from 2001 until the present, we've continued all of the biodiversity conservation activities that we had through the objectives, anchored on the objectives of the park. We still see majority of the species that we encounter, we've encountered in the past, and also, another improvement that we see is the addition of another, another protection, which is through the expanded NIPAS. So from 1992, there, there was an improvement on the protection and provisions for conservation under the ENIPAS Act of 2018. Although the, um, although the ENIPAS Act added 94 PAs, it also considered the legislated ones, which is the Northern Shera is. It has provisions on the improvement of developments entering the park. So we need more considerations to, to think of before we approve projects. And of course, one thing that actually matter or actually import, an important aspect of the ENIPAS Act was the improvement or the addition of a more expanded PA management board. So in 2001, we already had 31, 35 members, but now through the 2018 ENIPAS Act, it was expanded. We realized that there should be more participatory towards barangay chairpersons. From 35, we now have 66 PAMBI members. So what do the PAMBI, Mambi, PAMBI board do? Actually, apart from the policy making, they are the ones regulating or reviewing all of the all of the developmental projects coming in the park they have a role to safeguard our non-negotiables can you imagine that the last great forest majority of which is under protection or under this under the strict protection zone and with the leadership of our chair right now uh, pambi chair regional executive gwendolyn bambalan we are having a lot of discussions on our non-negotiables. And we are firm that if it's within the strict protection zone, there would be no developments. Alas, it's really a work in progress. Given that the park, although it's big size, there are also communities residing in it. And as Sir Loritan has shared a while ago, yes, and there are very much challenges underway for the park. In, 2020, in 2023, this year, we were able to assess the threats 
that is occurring within the park. And we've realized that there is still work to be done. And we need a lot of help and support, not only from the people of Isabella, but as a country. We are this, the protection of NSMNP is an intergenerational commitment. So the results of the MET, we do a management effective test, management effectiveness assessment every five years. For 2023, if you can see, we've seen that we have a nine threats, high threats. You can see their high threats being 65%, the rating would be 65% and above. And the top two would be commercial and industrial areas and recreational and tourism. So it's entering the park. And that's one challenge of the PAMBI and its stakeholders. We see a lot still of developments coming in. And actually, as a PA secretariat, I am witness to how did they deliberate and really not decide early on what to approve any project without really considering its impacts. So basically right now, what we are hoping is that what we saw in 1975 and early 2000, we still have to maintain those areas. And as the current heirs of the park, including you, we hope that you can support us more in the protection and conservation of the park. So with that, that is the story of the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park in Capsule. That's why whenever I read about its history, I, as I said early on, I feel like I'm standing on the shoulder of the giants. It has its long way. A lot of birding pains happened and now us, we have to maintain whatever we had to save. We have to save whatever we can save and conserve right now so that our, uh, our next generation can still see the last great forest in its entirety. So for any inquiries, thank you so much for that. For any inquiries, you can email us at dnr2.nsmnp at gmail.com. Thank you so much, Sir Brian. Thank you, Ms. Cherish, for taking us down uh, memory lane on the um, history, historical conjunctures of the NSMNP, and also for bringing to our attention the um, high threats, the, need, the, the things that need to be done, um, the things that need to be addressed um, in our current times um, to conserve and to protect the Northern Sierra Madre natural park so if you have questions for miss cherish just feel free to chat those um on our q a um, chat box um thanks again uh miss cherish so we now proceed our next presentation so our next presentation is about the ecosystem services, the biodiversity that can be found um, in Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park and the um, conservation actions being done um, by civil society groups, by multiple um, actors um, in the park. So this is going to be presented in an audio recorded um, presentation by Ms. Marika Gatan Albas, um, who studied social forestry at Isabella State University and has been a community organizer and environmental conservation advocate in Northern Sierra Madre since 1995. She's also the director of operations of the Mabuaya Foundation. And Sir Merlin Van Weird, who is a Dutch biologist who has been involved in biodiversity research and conservation in Northern Sierra Madre since 1999. He's one of the founders of Mabuaya Foundation and its executive director. Good afternoon to all our viewers. I hope everyone is excited to listen about the beauty of the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park, especially so that we are celebrating the Save Sierra Madre Day today. I believe that this celebration is happening in many parts of the country. This morning, we have the same celebration in Santa Ana, Cacayan, attended by 300 high school and college students. 
By the way, I am Tess Gatan Balbas, the Director of Operations of the Maboya Foundation, and with me is Merlin Van Weerd, our Executive Director. The Cheramadio Mountain Range is the longest mountain range in the Philippines with a length of 540 kilometers. It covers one provinces from Santa Ana from the north to Quezon in the south, and it is considered as the backbone of Luzon Island. In the provinces of Cagayan and Isabela, we find the following nationally protected areas, the Palawi Protected Landscape and Seascape, the Bawa Wangag Watershed Forest Reserve, the Magapit Protected Landscape, Piña Blanca Protected Landscape and Seascape, Tumawini Watershed Natural Park, Puyot Spring National Park, and the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park. The Bawa Wangag Watershed Forest Reserves are not part of the National Integrated Protected Area System, though. The large area in blue in Northeast Cagayan is one of the largest unprotected forest areas of the Philippines. At the moment, the Maboy Foundation is implementing a USAID-funded project together with the DNR and the local government unit and other partners in the Philippines. But today, we will be talking about the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park, which is the largest protected areas of the Philippines and one of its most diverse in terms of ecosystem and species diversity. The Northern Sierra Madre protects Cagayan Valley from the impact of typhoons that come from the Pacific Ocean. The forests absorb superfluous rainwater, thereby preventing floods, and releases this water during dry periods, always providing Cagayan Valley with water. Without the forest cover of the northern Sierra Madre, people in Cagayan Valley would not be safe during dry season, and there would not be enough water for drinking and irrigation during dry periods. The humid forest also generates its own rain. On a hot summer afternoon, you see the built up of clouds over the Sierra Madre from evaporation of water in the forest, leading to thunderstorms that are welcomed by farmers. You don't see similar built up of clouds over the nuded mountains. The forest also provides non timber forest products upon which the indigenous Agda communities depend on, such as rattan. They make baskets out of rattan for their livelihood. And during the tan fruiting season, the IPs earn a lot of money from selling these to the market. The IP communities also harvest honey from the forest and meat of wild animals such as this Philippine deer. The rivers and coastal ecosystems provide fish and crustaceans, and the forest provides traditional medicines such as these medical flowers. Forests also provide aesthetic and spiritual values. Who does not become happy from a walk in the woods? The Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park has a huge potential for ecotourism, and if wisely managed, this can be sustainable income generating activity for many forest prince and indigenous communities. And now the ecosystems and iconic species of the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park will be shared to us by Merlin Van Weerd. Merlin? Thank you very much, Tess. Um, welcome to everyone. My name is Merlijn van Weert. I'm a Dutch biologist. I've been working in the Northern Sierra Madre uh, for more than 20 years with Mabuaya. So let's have a look at the ecosystems and some of the iconic species of this area. We'll start in the coastal area. Here we find marine waters, coral reefs, reef flats, seagrass beds, mangrove forest and beach forest. Of course, very important for fish and for corals. But we find here as well the saltwater crocodile, the largest crocodile in the world, found from India to Australia, uh, including the Philippines. So it's not globally threatened, not endemic, but in the Philippines, this species has, has become very, very rare. Uh, and the population in the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park is the last wild population in Northern Philippines. Um, it's therefore listed as critically endangered on the DAO list, the Department Administrative Order 2019-09 from DNR. And this is the list of threatened flora and fauna in 
the Philippines, uh, which is linked to the Wildlife Act. Another species we find here is the green sea turtle, uh, found in tropical seas, so not endemic, but listed as endangered on both the DAO list and the IUCN global uh, list of threatened species, the red list. Uh, this species feeds on seagrass beds. Also found uh, in the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park is the Hawksbill sea turtle. We do not have good photographs of it, but a beautiful drawing by Isabella State University student Rafi Vakani. Uh, this uh, species feeds on sponsors and jellyfish in coral reefs, uh, and it's listed as critically endangered. Both sea turtle species are known to nest in the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park. Here we see lowland dipterocarp and limestone forest if we go inland, the last great forest of the Philippines. And here we find species such as this green racquetail, a very rare parrot, uh, otherwise only found in the Subic Bay area. Uh, and then we to Luzon, uh, listed as endangered on the ICN red list and critically endangered on the Dow list. Uh, it's so rare because of the pet trade. Also, there are several pairs of Philippine eagles in the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park. Uh, of course, this is the national bird of the Philippines and it's listed as critically endangered. Increasingly rare, the Northern Rufus Hornbill, endemic to Northern Philippines, listed as vulnerable uh, on the red list and endangered on the Dow list. Northern Sierra Madre still has flocks of this species, but you have to go far into the forest to see them. This is the uh, mascot species of the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park, the Isabella Oriole, critically endangered, one of the rarest birds in the world with a known uh, wild population of only 50 individuals, of which some are found in the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park. Another species only described in 2010, the Bitatawa, a fruit-eating monitor lizard, endemic to the Northern Sierra Madre and Northern Cordillera, and listed as vulnerable. There is a very specific forest type, uh, forest on ultra basic or ultra mafic soils. These contain heavy metals and that leads to stunted uh, tree growth and also lots of endemic species. But the flora of this uh, forest type has not been very well studied. We know that there are lots of pitcher plants here. This is a common species, Nepenthes alata, but there are probably lots of uh, uh, plant species still to be described from this very specific and special forest type. We also find roost sites of flying foxes in Divilikan and Dinapigi in the ultra basic forest because it's so difficult to penetrate. Probably they're roosting here so that hunters cannot reach them. Uh, and these roost sites include the golden crowned flying fox, which is endemic to the Philippines, one of the largest bats in the world very important uh, pollinator and seed distributor um, and listed as endangered on the red list and critically endangered on the Dow list. The roost site in the Vilican is probably one of the largest in the Philippines. Higher up the mountains we find montane and mossy forest. Not much known about these areas because they are so difficult to reach, but we know and it's also been documented that we have here the Montaigne or Luzon racquetail, the nephew of the green racquetail, um, endemic to Luzon, near threatened on the IUCN red list, but critically endangered on the Dow list. Uh, very uh, few pictures of this species exist, and this is one of the few pictures of the male with the red uh, dot on the head. All pictures in this presentation were made by uh, Mabuaya Foundation. Um, the forest of the Sierra Madre feeds uh, lots of rivers with clean water. Here we find endemic fish, but also the uh, giant softshell turtle, um, which is listed as critically endangered on the ISN red list, uh, but as, uh, as data deficient on the Dow list. This could be a new species, could be a Philippine endemic species, but it has not been described. So lots of research to be done on this species. In freshwater, we also find the Philippine crocodile, uh, the rarest crocodile in the world, critically endangered. And there are only two remaining wild populations, one in southwest, southwestern Mindanao and one in northeast Luzon. The Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park is crucial to the survival of this species in the wild. 
Um, they're found in San Mariano inside the park, but also in rivers outside the park. And here, Mabuaya, Mabuhay Buaya Foundation is trying to conserve this species together with DNR and the local government and local communities. There are also small populations still in Makonakon and Tivilikan, and until recently in Palanan. So we've seen that uh, the Sharamadra is of very, very great importance for several endemic threatened species. This is just a few species uh, that I've shown. The diversity is, uh, is immense. Um, but with all these endangered and critically endangered species, the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park is one of the most important protected areas of the Philippines and probably of the world. Mabuaya has been working here for more than 20 years uh, in all the nine municipalities. Recently, uh, we have mainly been working with uh, local government units of Makonako, Divilikan and San Mariano, always in partnership with DNR and uh, very often also with Isabella State University. So some recent conservation actions, we've been working with the local government of Divilikan, uh, Menro, headed by uh, Menro Arthur Omengan, who established this beautiful sea turtle nursery in Lanai in Divilikan. Um, and here we see Arthur releasing a few uh, hatchlings, sea turtle hatchlings. This is the green turtle. Uh, very successful program. Last year, more than 1,000 baby uh, turtles uh, made it to the sea. So this is very important to ensure the survival of the sea turtles in the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park in the future. The Lanai uh, area also is a very nice area for workshops and trainings. This is last year. Uh, training of a youth nature group in Divilikan together with DNR and the LGU. We're supporting these groups uh, in Divilikan and in San Mariano. Last year as well in, uh, uh, in this area, a law environmental law enforcement training for the Bantai Kalikasam uh, Brigade and Menro staff. Um, and together with uh, the Menro staff and the uh, Bandai Kalika Sub Brigade. We monitor the crocodiles and the flying foxes and the sea turtles in the Vilikan. Here we see flying fox monitoring um, of the roost site in the Vilikan. In Samriano, we work mainly with DNR um, on crocodile conservation. Here we see a training last year in crocodile monitoring. Uh, we have a team of dedicated DNR personnel who is now joining the quarterly crocodile monitoring surveys. Uh, to save this species from extinction. Other activities we are currently involved in, agroforestry and reforestation uh, trainings and support to, uh, to reforestation activities. Well, there's lots more, but no more time. So I'll end the presentation here. And I wish everyone a, uh, a beautiful, safe Sierra Madre day. We've seen that this area is super important for lots of uh, critically endangered and endangered species, one of the most very uh, important protected areas in the world. So let's save the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park. Bye bye. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Merlin uh, and Ms. Tess, for your uh, presentation, for showing us the rich biodiversity and ecosystem of the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park. Um, sadly, they're not here um, today with us because they also have an event um, to celebrate the Save Sierra Madre Day today. Uh, but we thank you for, for your contribution and for sharing with us your efforts, uh, conservation efforts, and all the good photos of, of, of species um, that can be found in the park. Um, and so we're done with the presentations and we'll now proceed um, to our open forum. So if you have questions, um, feel free to send them to chat. Um, but while waiting for, for other questions, maybe I'll just ask first. Uh, so uh, for, for Ms. Cherish. Hi, Ms. Cherish. Hello. Yes, Sir Brian. Okay. Uh, so question, this question is for you. So you mentioned during your presentation that you have your non-negotiables and that you, um, that you employ participatory approach uh, in your conservation programs. And then um, during the last part of your presentation, you also showed different high threats. Yes. 
So I'd like to, to ask if you could expound um, on the idea of your non-negotiables in relation to your efforts or plans um, in addressing uh, the threats, the list of threats you mentioned, the industrial areas, the, um, um, the traditional knowledge, um, and others. So I'd like to ask if you could expound on that further. All right, thank you. For the non-negotiables, in any aspect of our lives, we have those, right? Mm -hmm. So in a park, our non-negotiables would be our biodiversity area, our biodiversity areas, our ecosystems, our forests, our species, and even the lives of our uh, community, especially on the indigenous uh, culture. So whenever we have a project coming in the park, mm -hmm. that would be our Bible that would be our decision matrix if it's allowed or not. But as you can see, and even in reality, that some projects or activities are being implemented without even uh, we are not review, we cannot review them um, ultimately since they are already being implemented on the ground. The Nordic Sierra Madre Natural Park is very big and as an effort, to be able to monitor everything, we partner up with the LGU as well as the NGOs and local communities to check. And that's why we're able to still see that our non-negotiables, we always have a lengthy discussion during our board meeting on why we cannot allow activities with that. But what we do with that is that, for example, if there are roads, road networks being constructed and it's already towards the strict protection zone, we cut that. We stop that and there would always be an opportunity for discussion on possible solutions such as why do we have to need a road for the natural park when in fact Palawan and Batanes don't need a road and they're being they're being um, um, flocked with tourism activities so it opens up options for a more sustainable approach last meeting we have had that if we can have more wider airports but then that's another issue on opening again areas and honestly we only have sustainable use zone and multiple use zones within the park to consider for the developments so that's actually one of the challenge in being part of the board and mm -hmm. maintaining our non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. Our non-negotiables would actually be the crux of our decision every time. Mm -hmm. If it's within the SPZ, then there's no discussion. There should be no discussion further. Yeah. And then, as I said, we need the help. We need help. If the, pan if the PA management office would only be the one to function, we cannot do it all. I think we're only three. Apart from our POSU, our superintendent, we are supported by the DNR. But we are so lucky, as I said, from the breathing pains that we have, from those consortium, uh, consortium of NGOs who are already senior managers at LGUs, they are actually actively supporting the conservation and protection efforts. So in their plans, the local plans of the LGUs, they recognize the park already. And... Right now, we are seeing improvements on their land use planning that if, it's, if it falls in the SPZ or strict protection, they're not doing any more construction. I think except for the Ilagan de Vilacan Road, which was really a very lengthy discussion as well, that we needed to balance economic and conservation efforts. It always makes me think we are saturated with the concept of sustainable development. But when you implement it on the ground, you realize there are many nuances that needs to be harmonized and needs to be tackled in order to get that, um, um, in order to reach sustainable, sustainable development within a park. So it's quite a challenge and we're still hope, and I hope through the Save the Sierra Madre Day, happy, happy Sierra Madre Day, by that thought alone, recognizing Sierra Madre would incite the support that we need for our non-negotiables within the park. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cherish. Um, 
So what I'm uh, actually getting is that uh, with the immensity of um, the area of the park, it's really important. Uh, the, the, the role of local government units um, is really important. Their coordination to be able to be a, to be a, to be to be able to um, address the challenges you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thanks for that. And I think there's also a question here. Uh, Okay, uh, there's a question here, but just feel free, Sir Laurie and uh, Ms. Cherish, to answer. Um, in connection with the topic on biodiversity here in the Philippines, what are your comments about the construction of Kaliwa Dam at the location that is being mentioned? So I, I guess it's just related to um, infrastructure and how it affects um, the landscape. You know, when, uh, when you talk about parks, mm. I was seeing what you said. When you see St. Paul's in Palawan, the tourism goes into that area, and yet there's a lot of fees that are being sent. You were talking about Batanes. People go up to Batanes. That is also a park area. And yet tourism also pay fees. Now, let's not talk about tourism. The park brings water. Water supplies the rivers. The rivers go into the corn and the rice fields. Isn't there a way to earn a fee from people who get water for rice and corn? Even a small amount. If you look at all the hectares that are covered in the Cagayan Valley, can they obtain income that will regularly manage to the Sierra Madre? That's my question. Yes, I think, uh, Mr. Thank Eric. You. Oh, okay, that was it. All right. Actually, sir, that is a good perspective on sustainable financing the protected area through payment of ecosystem services. And honestly, water is free within right now in the communities. Um, for now, there are projects being pipelined and in consideration of NIA, uh, National Integrated uh, Administration projects on irrigation we have seen the potentials of that but then as i said right now there are minimal majority of the infrastructures that we are look uh we are seeing being developed in the northern Sierra would include roads and uh, at the side of the northern part of Sierra madre which is actually tumawini uh, that's another park they have established that they were able to establish fees in connection to the water use. But basically, that's that's when the NIA came in and built a dam. But then for the community, right now we can look into the opportunity of having those kinds of fees for them. Especially, you're right, that majority of the communities within the park, on the eastern side even, they're very dependent on agriculture. Um, crops like rice, we have a good rice. We, I, I love their their rice there. And but then we have limited um, infrastructures for now for the water to be distributed to all of the agricultural areas. So that is one thing that we can consider to support more fees and to support the operation of the park. Thank you, Sir Lord. We did. 
basically we don't have yet those kinds. The only fees that we have in addition, yeah, in addition, the only fees that we are collecting right now for the park would be entrance fees. And it's really hard to collect with the uh, park, um, other developments in the park, such as tourism-based and even resource-based. And right now, what we need to have is a basis, a study or any basis so that we can really employ how much we would be asking the community who are dependent on the water, on the watershed, in terms of payment of ecosystem services. So if we would have that kind of study and data, then we can really employ or we can really institute the payment of for ecosystem services within our park. And that would contribute to the user fees of the park. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cherish and uh, Sir Laurie. Really great points on um, sustainable financing and payment for ecosystem services. Um, and maybe before we proceed um, to our next, uh, to the next part of this uh, webinar, I'd like to ask Sir Laurie, um, so it's been more than two decades since the publication of your book, The Last Great Forest. And um, can you... Can you tell us more about what prompted you to this idea to have, you know, an updated um, information about that and um, to have a digital platform for, for Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park? You know, I'm, I'm, um, we're changing the way people bring about both the way of books. You know, uh, let me look at the very, uh, young people today. Uh, those of you who go to school, I'm pretty sure many of the children today use iPads. And if we see that I was really using iPads, can we get more information on a knowledge platform on iPads? That's a big opportunity. Aside from articles or articles, we should be able to show YouTubes, maps that can move, that are active maps, uh, stills, so that the new generation can get more information on the Sierra Madre, even without a book. I think it's a big opportunity here. It's a new, it's a new way of getting information to make sure that it can be changed even every three, month, three months or six months, you will have new versions of the knowledge platform. And wow, every time you have a new student gone to school about the Sierra Madre, they will have new information every year. It's a big opportunity. Sayang ito, sayang. You know, when we talk about tourism, for example, uh, for years, Filipinos have put up all these books on, let's say, food, on food all through the Philippines. Then I found out the other day, if you go to Thailand, or you go to Vietnam, or to Hong Kong, or to Japan, a lot of the statements, information on food in Thailand, Vietnam, in places like Hong Kong, Taiwan, they use YouTube. They don't use they don't use books anymore. This is on knowledge platforms. And I think we should look at the Sierra Madre the same way, to show them more information and update more information on these new, uh, for example, the vegetarian monitor. Can we get more information on that instead of one picture? Can we have more information on the movement of trackers of the Philippine Eagle rather than one single still. I think it's a very, very good opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Laurie. So yeah, we value the importance of multimedia-based learning. And so uh, with Sir Laurie's uh, idea to develop this knowledge platform, the Forest Foundation partnered with Drink Sustainability Communications to craft um, the NSMNP knowledge platform, um, wherein we see it as like what, what Sir Laurie said, like a living um, archive that we can update from time to time that if, if we want information related to Northern Sierra Madre National Park, this is the knowledge platform that 
um, will go to. So to um, show to us the knowledge platform um, in its initial stage of development, um, I'd like to call on the senior project manager um, of Drink Sustainability Communications. Drink, Sustain Drink is the leading um, consultancy from specialized consultancy firm specializing in sustainability and communication for development in the Philippines, Hannah Claire Madamba. Hi, Hannah. So, everyone, good morning. So, to synthesize all of the insights that were shared today, ayan, we're very happy to announce that we have partnered with Forest Foundation Philippines to create this soft launch of this knowledge trend, uh, platform for the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park. So you can actually access this by typing northern Madre.forestfoundation.ph. So please note that this knowledge platform is still in its soft launch stage. So kindly ac access the link through, the, through your desktop to ensure that you are fully utilizing the site. So the overall objective of this knowledge transfer platform aims to update you on the status of the park and also for you to share your current knowledge and if there are ongoing activities to further conserve the park. So we all know that conservation, uh, forest management can be seen as intimidating, especially when we talk about the specific species, uh, the current laws and regulations to protect the park, and the overall science when it comes to forest man management. So we created this uh, knowledge platform to make sure that everyone has an avenue of understanding about Northern Chair Northern Chair Madre. So we would uh, greatly appreciate your participation since your participation can also be helpful for us to see if there are current initiatives that you're doing. So whether it's through a personal level or if you work with other entities like NGOs or, or other government agencies and the like. So allow me to walk you through the site and feel free to check the site out while I discuss this. So the knowledge uh, platform was made to spread the word about the importance of the park, the threat it faces, uh, conservation efforts, and existing research. So we developed this platform with the help of Sir Laurie, Sir Nestor, and also the Mabua Mabuaya Foundation. So you can also see here, uh, particularly you can learn more about the park and how it is essential to wildlife, uh, its residents, and the rest of the country. Uh, the site also here explains the current threats that the park faces, so showing the effects of excessive or illegal uh, illegal human activities that take place within it. And we also have here, uh, we also featured here the current policies and regulation that help to conserve and uh, properly manage the park. We also created a map here showing the major infrastructure developments and hotspots for prohibited activities that have taken place within the park. And uh, lastly, for this knowledge uh, platform, we've also created here a submissions platform. So with this uh, platform, we would want it to be interactive and we would love to hear your insights. So particularly, uh, we want to showcase your experience in the NSMNP part. So if you have photos of animal or plant species that you would like to share, you can upload them here. And from there, uh, we'll be able to share verified photos on this page. And of course, we'll include your name as a photography credit. So aside from the photos, uh, we if you have any research on the Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park, uh, please feel free to submit it too. And the last call to action here would be if you have if you're involved in conservation efforts or actions for the NSMNP, uh, feel free to submit them here as well. So we accept submissions about either ongoing or completed projects. So over time, uh, we will continually update this website and include all of your submissions here in this platform and again uh, the main purpose of this knowledge pla platform is to serve as a hub of information about the park's ongoing threats along with the conservation efforts and research that are being done for the park so we would greatly appreciate all of 
your help populating this platform and sharing your photos, research, or conservation efforts. So yeah, we look forward to your submissions and thank you for joining us in comm commemorating Save Share Amadia Day. Thanks so much, Hannah, for walking us through uh, the platform so that uh, Northern Sierra Madre, um, that foundation.ph. So we'll continue to develop uh, the platform. We'll continue to improve the information um, that's currently there. Um, we'll provide and include more photos. Um, currently, the photos uh, included there are from Sir Lori and Sir Merline of uh, Mabuaya Foundation but would love to know more, um, especially those researches that are being conducted um, in Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park, because as um, the threats uh, advance um, in the park, um, we also see that knowledge are also advancing um, in the park and would love to know how um, and see how uh, those knowledge produced can be used to inform um, better management, better protection, and better policies um, for the park. So um, for our participants here in the webinar, um, if you're interested to partner with the Forest Foundation or to apply for a grant to protect and conserve um, Sierra Madre Forest landscape, um, um, with me here, um, is uh, Sierra Madre Landscape Coordinator of Forest Foundation Philippines, Forrester Eric Butuan. Thank you, Brian. Uh, isang makabuluang araw ng Sierra Madre sa ating lahat. As discussed po doon sa mga unang presentations, uh, tunay nga pong napakahalaga, napakaganda ang Sierra Madre, uh, particular yung Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park, hindi lang para sa biodiversity o sa mutsaring buhay, kundi para sa kapakanan ng mga tao at komunidad na nakatira si Isabela sa Cagayan. Sama-sama na nating uh, pangalagaan, protektahan ang Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park at siyempre may iba pang natitirang kagubatan sa buong Sierra Madre. Na nabanggit kanina, buong Sierra Madre mula Cagayan hanggang Quezon, mga sampung probinsya yan. So ang Forest Foundation Philippines o kilala nung una na Philippine Tropical Forest Conservation Foundation ay naitatag nga po noong 2002 para tumulong na pangalagaan ng mga kagubatan sa Pilipinas. Kami uh, nagmamanage ng isang uh, uh, grants o tulong pinansyal. Kasama na rin po dito yung tulong sa technical at kasama yung Sierra Madre sa aming priority landscape. Sa pamamagitan po ng aming resource framework 2023-2027, uh, meron kami nakalaang uh, pondo, uh, tulong pinansyal para sa mga proyekto, programa na naglalayong mas mapangalagaan o mga kagubatan ng uh, Sierra Madre. So sa loob ng limang taon, ang mga proyekto na aming tutulungan, pupunduhan ay inaasahan na magre-resulta sa apat na outcomes. Yung apat po yon, to yung grow forest, grow opportunities, grow partners, at grow advocates. So grow forest po, nasahan natin na mas mapangalagaan ang mga naiwan, ang mga natitirang kagubatan, at yung mga lugar naman, kagubatan na pwede pang i-restore, ibalik sa dating uh, uh, klase o dating uh, uh, anyo ay may balik natin sila through appropriate na restoration uh, efforts para ito sa kabutihan ng kasalukuyang henerasyon at sa mga susunod pa na henerasyon. Sa grow opportunities naman, nasahan na matugunan yung uh, pangangilangan ng mga tao at komunidad na nakadepende sa mga likas yaman sa Sierra Madre para sa, pa, sa pamamagitan ng suportang kabuhayan, sustainable livelihood, incentives. Nabanggit po kanina ni Sir Lori yung potential ng uh, FIV galing sa paggamit po ng tubig. Nabanggit ni Ma'am Chia kanina yung uh, PES. So hindi lang po yung actual na pag-improve 
yung uh, kabuhayan ng mga uh, komunidad na tao na nasa loob ng Sierra Madre, katulad ko na po yung pag-harvest ng ratan, meron din titing natin ng economic incentive na abang inalagaan nila yung kabundukan, sila din nabibigyan ng opportunities na ma-improve yung kanilang socio-economic uh, conditions. At dito naman po sa growing partnership, yung cross-sectoral cross partnership for sustainable forest management, dahil ang conservation po ay hindi lang gawain ito ng gobyerno, hindi kayang gawin ng gobyerno lamang. Kailangan ng suporta, kailangan ng partisipasyon ng mga iba't ibang uh, sektor. So kailangan nating palakasin yung partners, palakasin natin yung partnership para may sakatuparan ang mga napakadaming plano para sa sustainable forest management. Sabi nga po nila, yung uh, plano kung hindi yan ay sasakatuparan ay wala rin saysay. At panghuli, yung Grow Advocates, magkakaroon po tayo ng mas malawak na advokasya, magkaroon ng dagdag na kalaman sa sustainable forest management, sa pamamagitan ng mga transdisciplinary, participatory uh, approaches, at pagbabahagi o sharing documentation ng mga uh, experiences, lessons, then pag-share sa mga iba-ibang uh, sektor para mas magamit nila itong mga knowledge uh, materials na ito. So yun po yung uh, layunin ng mga projects. Uh, kahit kami po ay nananawagan sa mga civil society organizations, community-based organizations, uh, people's organizations, NGOs, pati ra po mga individuals na mayroong interes at kapasidad para sa forest conservation na may pagpartner sa amin, na mag-submit po ng proposal sa amin. At uh, kung may Kakulangan naman po sa kapasidad, lalo po yung mga people's organizations, committee-based organizations, ay kasama po sa tulong namin yung pagpapalakas ng kapasidad para maka po maka-access ng funding. So doon po sa grants and technical assistance, meron po ditong website na pwede niyong puntahan, yung grants.forcefoundation.ph, pwede rin niyong po email sa amin yung proposals ninyo or explore yung partnership with us. So ito nandito po yung mga pwedeng uh, contact uh, information uh, tungkol po sa uh, grant making work ng Forest Foundation uh, Philippines. So sama-sama po nating alagaan, sama-sama nating protektahan ang Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park at naway itong ating uh, isang oras, mahigit isang oras na aktividad ngayong umaga bilang selebrasyon ng uh, Save uh, Sierra Madre o uh, Sierra Madre Day ngayong araw, October 26, ay maging isang ambag o maging isang hakbang para sa mas mayabong na kagubatan, mas maunlad na komunidad, mas resilient na communities sa uh, hindi lang po sa Northern Sierra Madre, pati yung kabuang uh, Sierra Madre Range. Uh, of course po yung Cagayan Valley na kung saan ito nakikinabang sa mga ecosystem services po ng uh, Sierra Madre. So in closing po, uh, ako po ay nagpapasalamat kay Sir Lori, uh, sa staff po ni uh, Paso, si uh, Ma'am Chay, Ma'am Chi pala, Ma'am Chi, uh, si, uh, mga ka partner namin sa drink, yung mga nagbigay po ng, uh, sa mga buhaya pala, Uh, sa mga nagbigay po ng information about yung Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park, kami po nagpapasalamat sa effort nito at nabanggit nga po ito, ito ay simula pa lamang ng pag-aayos itong uh, digital platform. Uh, abangan po ninyo yung uh, activities, uh, follow activities nitong work ng uh, Northern Sierra Madre as the Philippines uh, last great forest. Uh, next year po, may mga activities pa rin pong patuloy na gagawin and definitely maging uh, fully functional po yung uh, platform na magamit na uh, hindi lang mga researchers, hindi lang mga conservationists, kundi yung mas nakakaraming uh, sector na nakikinabang, naapektuhan po ng mga uh, na pangyayari sa buong uh, uh, Sierra Madre. So muli po, uh, On behalf po sa uh, Forest Foundation Philippines, ng aming executive director, ng aming board, ng uh, staff po ng uh, Forest Foundation Philippines, kami po nagpapasalamat sa itong uh, celebration na ito uh, na isang oras pero ang daming nating natutunan and uh, looking forward to a uh, more engagement, uh, more partnership, uh, more uh, partners towards uh, conservation po ng Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park at at the same time yung uh, Sierra Madre uh, landscape. So salamat po. Uh, agbiag ti Northern Sierra Madre Natural Park. Agbiag ti Sierra Madre. Thank you, Brian.
Thank you so much, Sir Eric, and thank you everyone for celebrating Save Shara Madre Day with us. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Pa. Thank you.